lobby. Right now, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 5 in your Bible, in a Bible under the seat in front of you, uh, or on your mobile device. While you're finding Mark 5, I want to let you know that with today's passage, we will actually now have looked at all four Gospels as a part of this sermon series, which is pretty cool if you ask me. More importantly, I want to let you know this is our fourth and final Sunday of exploring our mission statement, following Jesus together in all of life. Now, by that, by that, I mean this is our final chance of exploring this as a part of this sermon series. We will actually spend several more, we will spend much more time exploring our mission statement and more importantly, trying to live into our mission in the weeks and months and years to come. That will include in the new year as we begin to look at some of our core values together as a church. I'll have more to say about that later, but right now I'd like to look at Mark chapter 5 with you. Hopefully you found it. We'll be reading verses 1 through 20. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding at a nearby, a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon, uh, to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him, begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in all the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So have you ever been excited and frightened like at the exact same time? Of course you have, right? Have you ever been on a roller coaster? or gone on a first date, you know what it's like to be both excited and frightened at the same time. If you've ever been on an inner tube behind a boat with someone who doesn't want you to stay on that inner tube, you know what it's like to be excited and frightened at the same time. If you've ever stood on stage, unless you're you know, crazy like preachers, if you've ever stood on stage or had to give a speech or played in a big game or opened a college acceptance or rejection letter, you know what it's like to be both excited and frightened at the same time. If you've ever done many things that are unfamiliar or adventurous, you know what it was like for Jesus' disciples to get into a boat and to sail across the Sea of Galilee. Of course, it would probably help to to look at a picture of this to understand the fullness of this. And it would not actually be this. This is actually Lieutenant Dan's encounter with God in the movie Forrest Gump. It's quite a different story, but actually it is a pretty similar situation, although I'm not sure the disciples said this with such confidence. I'm talking about the picture that Mark paints in chapter 4 of his gospel, which is right before today's passage. Mark says in chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, that a storm came out of nowhere, and the disciples were terrified. The good news is Jesus calms the storm, But that also terrified the disciples. Now, if you're wondering why the disciples are terrified of Jesus, it's because they'd never seen anything like this before. And if you're wondering why Jesus' disciples, who were all fishermen, are afraid of the sea, 
It's because Jews were afraid of water. Deep water, that is. Specifically, the sea. That includes Jewish fishermen who, believe it or not, did not go to the middle of the sea. Jewish fishermen fished around the edges of the sea. Do you know why? Because people in the ancient world, including most ancient Jews, believed that that center of the sea, that dark and chaotic place, is where spiritual beings, whether they're ghosts or demons or gods, that's where they entered the world. Ancient people believed that, that spiritual beings entered the world through holes in the earth. Some of those were on land, like the gates of Hades, which I mentioned earlier. But most of them were believed to be in that dark abyss known as the sea. Jews believed that something creepy and scary happened in the middle of the sea. And even if they didn't believe in all the specifics about ghosts and spirits, they were still pretty creeped out by the sea. Kind of like we are today with graveyards. Right? You may not believe that ghosts are real, but I bet you don't want to be alone in a graveyard at midnight on Halloween. It was the same with Jews, including Jewish fishermen. Jesus' disciples are terrified as they're going across the abyss known as the Sea of Galilee. And not just because of the abyss, but actually because what they believed was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Or the Lake of Galilee. Same thing. Jesus says, let's go to the other side of the lake, which sounds really innocent to us, but those are about the most frightening words that a Jew could hear, because Jews did not go to the other side of the lake or the sea. That's because not only did demons perhaps work in the middle of the sea, but that was a land of demonic things. Last week, we looked at a passage where Jesus seemed to go off script when he invited a, a tax collector to follow him as a disciple. Not only does Jesus go off script this week, he goes off the map, maybe even off the rails this week. Because Jesus sails his disciples to a land of the Gerasenes on the other side of the lake. And Gerasenes was a land of the pagans. That's probably the one group on this map here that we really haven't discussed. Pagans. Pagans is not a derogatory term. Pagans is a term that is used to refer to anyone who practiced a, another religion than the monotheistic religion of Judaism and later Christianity and even later Islam. The land of the Gerasenes was a land of the pagans. It was a land where strange and believed to be demonic religions were practiced. Now, on the left side of the lake, where Jesus and the disciples are from, you could practice the Jewish faith. That's because Rome, even after they conquered Israel, said, you can do your own thing under our watchful eye. On the other side of the lake, however, there were no Jews. There was only Roman and pagan religion. Now, the Romans had lots of gods, but the thing about Roman gods is they were pretty much like human beings with superpowers and superhuman appetites. I mean, you may remember some of the stories that you learned maybe in high school with Greek and Roman mythology that these gods were kind of known for feasting <laughs> and getting drunk and debauching themselves and, for, and fornicating. And that's actually the way that most Roman pagan practices, uh, worship, took place. You emulated the things of the gods. Long story short, Jesus' disciples are heading across the Sea of Galilee, the abyss known as the Sea of Galilee, and they're terrified, not just because what's happening or what they fear might happen in the middle of the lake, but also, too, what is awaiting them on the other side of the lake. Now imagine, in chapter 5, you land on the other side of the lake, and the first thing that happens is a demon-possessed man, a man with an unclean or impure spirit, comes out to meet you. This man says, what do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? And the disciples have to be thinking, wait a second, how does he know who Jesus is? And then Jesus says, hey, what is your name? And the demon-possessed man says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now here's where things get interesting. 
Now, the traditional site where this is believed to happen is a town called Kersey. It's over here in the land of the Gerencines. Although most scholars and archaeologists are starting to think that it actually happened in a place called Susita, which you'll see is pretty near Kersey. Susita means the place where Zeus is honored. Zeus was honored in many ways, including some of the kind of raucous religious ways, but he was also offered through sacrifice, specifically sacrifices of pigs. And I mean lots of pigs. Archaeologists have found massive amounts of pig bones in Susita, which isn't surprising given the fact that the 12th legion of the Roman army was stationed in Susita. Now, the Roman legion is about four to 6,000 troops. Those four to 6,000 troops would have honored Zeus in this area where Zeus is honored, and they would have done so likely through a lot of the, the kind of strange and, and, and pagan religious rites, but they would have also done so through the sacrifice of pigs. Well, guess what the symbol of the 12th legion of the Roman army is? A pig. Now, I don't want to bore you with all the details of the Roman culture, but can you see the scene that is being set for us here? The demon says, man says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And this legion of demons begs Jesus not to send, or begs them to send them into a herd of pigs. Now, interestingly, in Luke's gospel, where he records a similar account, those demons beg uh, Jesus not to send them into the abyss, that would be the sea, but rather into the pigs. Both accounts say Jesus gave the demons permission to go into the pigs, and when they did, the pigs ran down into the sea. The abyss, that is, where they drowned. Okay, Jesus' disciples have just seen Jesus calm the storm, which has a natural element, but also a supernatural element, given what they understand about the sea. And now here comes Jesus, who commands an unclean spirit to come out of a man and to go into some unclean animals, which run down the hill and die. They have to be thinking, what is going on here? And if they weren't already frightened enough, they certainly are now. And yet, this doesn't feel demonic, does it? I mean, Jesus doesn't seem to be sowing chaos here. He actually seems to be bringing some healing. And I say that because Mark tells us in verse 14... That the people who were tending the, the herd of pigs, when they saw this, they ran back to town to report this. And when they bring some people back with them, Mark says in verse 15, that when they came back, they found this man sitting in his right mind, talking with Jesus. This isn't chaos. This man is healed. He, he's delivered. There's something transformative that's happening here. This isn't chaos. This is the hope that Jesus has been preaching about come to life. At least that's the way the disciples are beginning to understand it. Because Mark says the people from Susita, when they show up, they plead with Jesus to leave. Now they can't deny that something has happened, but they don't understand it. And so they beg Jesus to go away. Well, Jesus is getting into the boat with his disciples. The demon-possessed man, who is now healed, begs Jesus to let him go with him. Jesus goes off script here one more time. Only this time it's not in who he calls to follow him as a disciple, but how and where he calls this man to follow him as a disciple. Did you catch this? Jesus said to this man, stay on this side of the lake. He says, go home and to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he has had mercy on you. Well, that's what he does. Verse 20 says, This man went and shared this with the people throughout the Decapolis. Decapolis is just the way they refer to the ten cities in this area, like Deca, ten polis cities. This man goes and shares this in the Decapolis. Jesus leaves the Decapolis. Interestingly enough, though, Jesus comes back to the Decapolis later. In fact, we think he goes back twice. And when he does... It's a very different reception. When Jesus comes back to the Decapolis in Mark chapter 7, the people beg him 
to heal a deaf man. That's the exact opposite of what happens in Mark 5, where they beg Jesus to go away. Why, why, why the different reception this time? Now, Mark doesn't tell us, but it seems that the man who is healed in chapter 5 actually spread the word to the point that people may actually believe that it's true. And because they show up believing that it might be true, some pretty remarkable things start happening. I mean, not only does Jesus heal the man in Mark 7 at the people's request, he teaches a, gr- a giant crowd of people in Mark chapter 8, people who traveled great distances to come and see him. On top of that, he miraculously feeds this great crowd of people with a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. He f- specifically feeds 4,000 people, which is awfully similar to something he did in Mark 6, where he fed 5,000 Jews on the other side of the lake. Oh, something just happened here. Jesus just did for the pagans what he did for the Jews. It's almost as if he's trying to tell these people that, you know what, I am the Messiah. I'm God's answer to the world's brokenness. Not just Israel's brokenness, but the world's brokenness. The point is, this man in Mark chapter 5 tells people what God had done to him in showing mercy to him. And this leads a whole bunch of people to show up when Jesus shows up and shows mercy to 4,000 people. What a remarkable story. And yet, what do we do with it? I mean, how do we apply this story to our lives, given the fact that, I think we can be honest, we don't exactly see the world the way people in the ancient world saw the world. Right? We don't... We we live in a post-enlightenment world where we tend to dismiss or at least downplay the spiritual realm. I actually happen to think that's a mistake. And I'm not saying that we should believe that ghosts come out of holes in the earth. I don't believe that. I'm not saying that we should be looking for demons under every rock when anytime something goes wrong. I'm just saying that I actually think we lose the ability to fully grasp what's going on in the world and in our lives when we limit ourselves to believe that what is real is only that which we can see. Still, so that we can see the point of the story, we aren't going to delve too deep into the spiritual realm today. We'll, We'll keep it here on the surface which I actually think is helpful given the fact that the things that happen in Mark chapter 5, while there is clearly more going on under the surface, do you see how much this interacts with everyday life? All the stuff about the legion and the pigs. What if our demons are the sins that so easily entangle us? What about, what if the impure, unclean things in our lives is the brokenness of our lives, which enslaves us and alienates us and does harm to us and to others? What if that's the demonic in our lives? What if God can rescue us from that? which he does in Jesus, and not just forgiving us from our sins, which he does, but actually bringing healing and rescuing us from our sins and all of the consequences associated with it. What if that's the story that we're talking about today? What if that became the story that we actually talked about in our lives? What if God's work in delivering us from our own brokenness and from the world's brokenness actually became the story that we proclaimed? What if God's mercy was the thing that began to animate the way that we live our lives? That's the question I want to invite you to to ask yourself today. That's the question that I want to invite us to consider as we try to make words on a screen become real in this community. What if the things that God does in Mark 5 actually began to happen here? What if we became people like the man man in Mark 5? What might God do? I know this is a hard question to ask, and maybe you're thinking, that sounds like wishful thinking. Again, this is a very different world. 
It's true. I mean, not only do we live in a post-enlightenment world where we tend to have intellectual objections to lots of spiritual things, the fact is, is we actually live in a post-Christian world. Or we might even say a world that sometimes feels anti-Christian or perhaps anti-church, because I actually think that most people don't reject Jesus. They reject what they see the church doing <laughs> in poorly reflecting Jesus. Like I often ask myself, how often does the world see the church doing things that are the opposite of what we see Jesus doing in the Gospels? This is why Brennan Manning said this, the single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Those are stinging words. But they don't have to be the end of the story. In fact, what I would like to invite you to consider is what might happen if we did something to change that. Of course, I say that knowing that we can't change church history. We can't change the church. We can't change other people. We can't even change ourselves. But God can. That's the point of Mark 5. He has power over everything, even us. What if we believed that? What if we invited God into all of our lives? I'm talking every bit of our lives. What if we actually looked and, and, and were committed to, to seeking the Spirit that, that Jesus might transform every bit of us? What might God do? You know, about 300 years after the events of Mark 5, there was a, a global gathering of the church. In 325, there was a thing known as the Council of Nicaea. This is a fresco that tries to, um, to demonstrate it. This happened uh, in 325 again, which is shortly after uh, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, we're not going to get into all the trouble that comes with a, a nation or empire declaring an official religion. Just know that something happened to the point where Christianity not only became legal, it, it became the predominant influence in the empire. As such, Christians were finally allowed to meet publicly without fearing martyrdom. Well, the Council of Nicaea was the first official public gathering of the global church at the time. Christians from all over the world gathered to talk about what it is they believed. Now, contrary to what guys like Dan Brown say in books like the Da Vinci Code, the Council of Nicaea did not create the church's beliefs. They confirmed the beliefs that were already practiced in the church. Christians were like, hey, uh, you believe that Jesus is God? Oh, so do we. Even though, honestly, we had a hard time with that. I mean, we were like monotheists. Like, we, we had a hard time grasping this idea of the Trinity. But we can't deny this is what Scripture teaches. We can't deny this is what Jesus modeled. And we can't deny that this is what his disciples have been dying, proclaiming for the last three centuries, including the first disciples, like the ones we see in Mark 5. Almost all of them died proclaiming that Jesus is God that he is the resurrection and the life, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That is what the Council of Nicaea affirmed. Now, for the record, the Council of Nicaea was not perfect. Church meetings never are. But it was foundational for the Christian faith. Well, guess what? There was a bishop from Susita at the Council of Nicaea. What? Think about that. Sasita, the place where Zeus is honored? That place on the other side of the lake, which is like Pleasure Island for Pinocchio, but like in a much more grown-up way? Is it possible that a demon-possessed man who was healed by Jesus shared his story in such a way that it actually changed the course of the world, that it actually affects the way that we worship today? Is it possible that God used an imperfect vessel like that to change the world? 
I think the answer is yes. The real question is, could God do that again? Could God do that here? Could God use imperfect vessels like us, an imperfect church like us, to bless this community and to change the world for the better? I think the answer is yes. But there's only one way to find out. Follow Jesus together in all of life. Let's see what God does.